Greetings, Pastor Mark Biltz here with El Shaddai Ministries, and I am thrilled to have with us right here in our studio, the famous, the rock star, wow. David <laughs> Nakreba. Well, thank you. Thank Yay. you. I just got off the plane yesterday. And you're awake. I and can't I'm believe awake. it. From Israel. From Israel. Uh, we just came out from a countrywide shutdown, but it was interesting that the Ben Gurion Airport opened up before the country opened up. And since I had the first opportunity to come over to the United States, I came to Pastor Mark and saying, <laughs> Pastor, I am here to be with you. It's been a long time since we see each other. Uh, last time I saw you in Israel, you were part of the Day to Praise. Yes. They did for uh, Israel's Independence Day. So I just thought, I want to see my friends. And this trip is about, you know, seeing friends. Well, we're so great to see you. For those that don't know David Nekrubman, he is an Orthodox Jew, and we are thrilled to have this relationship with him because one of his main focuses, too, is in building Jewish-Christian relations. Tell us a little bit about what organization you're with. So it's the Oratory Stone Center for Jewish-Christian Understanding and Cooperation. It was established in 2008 under the auspices of Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, who is the former chancellor of Oratory Stone. Uh, it's a Jewish educational institution with 3,000 students, a rabbinic seminary. Uh, Rabbi Riskin is also on the forefront of women's issues. So even women right now are taught the same curriculum as rabbis without receiving the title rabbi, but they are educated on the same level as a rabbi. So there's a special program for that. We have, uh, we have educational institutions for both men and women who are serving in the army. So uh, Rabbi Riskin has been sort of this trailblazer, and at the age of 80, he then stepped down and gave over the reins to Rabbi Kenneth Brander, who was the former vice president of Yeshiva University. So he made Aliyah two years ago to take over the reins of Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, and Rabbi Kenneth Brander has made Jewish-Christian relations the forefront of the future for Ortor Stone. So it's been a very exciting uh, 20 years within the sacred field of Jewish Christian relations, but specifically 13 years with Ortor Stone. You've been 13 years with Ortor Stone. Yeah. So we we created the first Orthodox Jewish institution in the entire world to proactively dialogue with Christians across denominations and actively cooperate. So uh, we're the first Orthodox Jewish institution to help out. Christians who live in Bethlehem to put food on their table called Blessing Bethlehem. Uh, so we have a certain heart for Christians who live in the Middle East and more specifically our neighbor and in the Palestinian Authority and many Christians are caught between ethnicity and religion. And uh, we've, because of this bridge building efforts, more and more Christians on the other side are willing to have a relationship with us. And one of them main, main is our Pastor Stephen Corey, who yes. you know very, very well. Yes. Well, I think it's interesting because Christianity is really being persecuted in the Middle East right now. It's totally being underreported. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. If you remember a few years ago on Easter Sunday, there were a few churches that were bombed in Egypt. So Pastor Corey and I came together. We sent the delegation over to Egypt and we gave out food packages to the people who were victims of the, of the bombing. And we gave a, um, a security what you call a security uh, metal detector for one of the churches. So that incident wouldn't happen again to that particular church. Amazing, amazing. Hey, I want all of you to know that David Nekrutman is so unique and so special. Uh, guess what he did? He is so interested in Jewish Christian relations as an Orthodox Jew, he actually went to Oral Roberts University. Tell us about that and what you studied and what you encountered. So uh, really blessings to uh, Dr. Mark Rutland, who was the former president of Oral Roberts University, along with Dr. Brad Young, who you know very, very well. Uh, so Dr. Brad Young used to invite me to teach his master classes at Oral Roberts University. Amazing. For a number of years. And then I actually met Mark Rutland on his first day of his convocation to the student body. So I meet him in this office, and then there's something very unique about Mark. He's very humble, but the office he's in seems to be very ostentatious for the person that's occupying the seat. So I just learned that Mark took over, uh, 
took over the p position of president for Oral Roberts University, and we became fast friends, and he asked me to give the blessings to the student body on his first convocation. And ever since then, we became really great friends. And then he has something called Global Servants, which is a uh, ministry to get women out of the sex trafficking business. Fantastic. And he brings his top donors every two years to come to Israel. And he asked me to give a Bible study oh, how in fun. the Galilee at, the, at his hotel. So I opened up with a little teaser. I said, sometimes the shortest verse in the Bible can teach us the greatest lessons. Of course. Right. So I said, for example, in, in Christian scriptures, the shortest verse is Jesus wept. And then I said, if Jews were tackling this text, we would ask, why is he weeping? And then I go through this Greek word about crying and weeping and shedding a tear. And I just said, you know, I understand Christians believe completely in the, the divinity of Jesus, but you also completely believe in his humanity. And here's his best friend in front of him, and he's shedding a tear. That's the humanity. So we should learn something from that in our own leadership lives, that we should not be robots to the people's right. concerns, right? So I did that in three minutes. And then I went into really the Hebrew scriptures about a certain short verse and the lesson to learn, be learned from and there. What's the shortest verse I'm not going to talk about that right now, so we don't have enough time. It's a whole thing. So uh, Mark comes over to me and says, You know, I've been working on that, that message for six weeks. You did it in three minutes. And as a joke, I said, Well, I guess that's my entrance exam into Oral Roberts University. And he stops and he says, If Rabbi Riskin allows it, then I will make it happen. And how many years did you attend Oral Roberts? Four and a half years. Four and a half years. Four and a half years. Uh, it was the most amazing experience. And the reason why I went to Oral Roberts University is because my last conversation with my own mentor in Jewish Christian relations, Jewish Christian relations was the late Rabbi Dr. Gerald Meister. And the conversation we had was, there's something about the Holy Spirit. While I understand there will be a divergence between Judaism and Christianity as far as a Trinitarian understanding of God, but the aspects of the Holy Spirit is something that can really bond us, sure. right? And therefore, we had this last conversation. It was literally, uh, we had a group of Yale University students, evangelical students and Orthodox Jewish students that came to Israel because they learned the Bible every week at Yale University together, Hebrew scriptures together, and they asked us to facilitate the trip. And Rabbi Meister was in Israel at the time, so we go to Rick Wenicke's, uh Fountain right. of Tears in Arad, yeah. and we put him in that, in that exhibit of the last seven sayings of Jesus on the cross, juxtaposed with a Holocaust survivor. It's right. a, a very unique yeah, exhibit. There. You've been there, I know that. Uh, but for our audience members who are right. seeing this, they might not know what, if I say Fountain of Tears, they might yeah, not know, know, they won't know. Rick is a good friend of mine, so we bring the students over there. Rabbi Meister, we didn't know at the time, gave his last talk. Wow. And as I was driving him back to his hotel, we were talking about this. He says, after Passover, let's continue the conversation. And unfortunately, Rabbi Meister passed away uh, right before Passover. So he literally, he went back to Israel, passed away, and then people said, so what are you going to do? You're going to need to take over your mentor's shoes. And I was like, Rabbi Meister is a genius. He speaks eight, he spoke eight languages. He, his niche was really Jewish-Catholic relations. He dabbled within mainline Christianity. Uh, my thing is really within the spirit-filled Christian world. I feel most comfortable there. And the Holy Spirit comes up all the time, obviously in spirit-filled circles. So I felt like after much prayer and researching almost 50 years of official Jewish-Christian dialogue that uh, the Holy Spirit was never something to talk about. Right? It was never part of any official conference. So I said, that's where I want, that's where I want to go. I want to contribute to that. And Brad Young being a friend, and all Roberts University having a center on the Holy Spirit, I felt that if I can be in your shoes to truly understand the other, to create the language needed to talk about this, I want to do that. So uh, to the credit of Oral Roberts University, they accepted a modern day Pharisee <laughs> in their halls. Uh, and it was the, one of the greatest experiences of my life. So how did your perspective change of Christianity from before you got into Christianity's mindset versus now? 
Uh, I would say when I first started off in Jewish Christian relations almost 20 years ago, with, with uh, I was working at the Israeli consulate in New York. So back then, Ambassador Alon Pincus and then consul, the consul for media and public affairs, Ido Haroni, um, asked me to take over the Christian portfolio after I attended a Night to Celebrate Israel at Bay Ridge Christian Center in Brooklyn, New York. And the success of that event really changed my entire life. Uh, I got to know Robert Stearns, who was one of the main speakers at this, at uh, eventually a, a program that we did at the Israeli consulate for a day to celebrate for the peace of Israel in March of 2002. But that whole entire story of when I entered into Jewish Christian relations, I can say in all honesty, I wanted a pre-packaged Christian. I will only deal with you if you fit my category on how I should deal with you. And, <laughs> and these are like the rules and regulations. And I think now... The paradigm changed. Huh? The paradigm changed because it is literally a miracle that a Christian would be willing to rethink replacement theology uh, in, in Christian thought for almost 1800 years replacement theology being that the church took over the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob we were no longer covenanted and the church became the new Israel and because of that a lot of things in the name of Jesus of the church officially doing bad things against the Jewish people was in the, the sort of the DNA of church doctrine so for a Christian to rethink that is a miracle now on top of that, they're willing to be proactive with Israel and the Jewish people to take it on something as their calling is another miracle. And then your willingness to come to Israel, because you could create your city on the hill in, <laughs> in some backwater in Mississippi, right? And you don't have to identify with the Jewish people or the state of Israel, but you're willing to come as part of your calling and then sow into Jewish causes, Israeli causes, and then I think the, the miracle of all miracles is the Hebraic roots. Like really saying, okay, I'm willing to rethink this paradigm. Of, I'm willing to take on what I would frame it as the Judaism of Jesus. So as we talked about, Christians believe the 100% divinity, the 100% of the humanity, but the humanity also includes- Being Jewish. Being Jewish, <laughs> right? So I realize in Jewish Christian relations, Jesus divides between Jews and Christians, but yet there is an anchor of conversation that Jews and Christians can have, and that's sort of the Judaism of Second Temple period yeah. and the things that came out from that and the development of that. So that to me is like, wow, it's a miracle. And then when we opened up the center 13 years ago, a Christian willing to learn from an Orthodox Jew, Scripture another miracle. is another miracle. So every day I wake up with miracles. So who am I to put on a pre package criteria to engage with a Christian? Well, to me, one of the, the next miracle that I'd like you to talk about, because you're even writing a book on it, is about the Sabbath. Yeah. Another miracle. Here you have these Hebraic roots people who want to keep the Shabbat, and yet, much of Orthodox Judaism is against them keeping the Shabbat, thinking they're stealing their Shabbat. Right. And so, tell us a little bit about that, and tell us about your book. I want people to get your book. I appreciate it. So, uh, it's, it's entitled, Your Sabbath Invitation. Oh, I like that. Your Sabbath, Sabbath invitation. invitation. Wow, Christians are invited to keep the Shabbat. Right, and it'll be available on YourSabbathInvitation.com. And the book really is, the premise of it is to be part of a messianic, prophecy. The, the That's second. incredible. That's incredible. People, you need to realize you are living in prophetic times. And if you want to be a part of messianic prophecy that's happening now, you need to keep your Sabbath. Go ahead. Right. So Isaiah 66, 23 is the second to the last verse of the book. And it talks about Kolbasa. Everyone will be celebrating Rosh the Chodesh, new moon, yes. the new moon yep, and the, the Sabbath. Sabbath. Yeah. All right. So we read Isaiah 66 when Shabbat falls on a new moon. Okay, like right? it, yeah. This is part of our yeah. Haftorah. Right. So if anyone's familiar with the Gospels, you know that when Jesus went into the synagogue, they were reading the Torah and the prophets. Yes. Right, we know that the prophets 
was something that was fixed in rabbinic Judaism when the Greeks outlawed public worship of Judaism. Right. And if right. you were caught doing anything within Dead. Judaism, you faced the death penalty. Uh, so to remind us that we should continue the weekly Torah portion that we were mandated to do in Judaism, uh, we decided that we would designate a pro prophet's reading that would be connected to the Torah portion. Sure. And that continue. And oh, how yeah. do I know it continue? Well, you have, we know Josephus talks about it, and we sure. know that the Gospels talk about it. So it's not something new. Right. It's been there. Okay. But uh, in Judaism, we read Isaiah 66 when Shabbat falls on Rosh Chodesh, on the new sure. moon. Therefore, from our standpoint, there is this messianic moment where the world will be celebrating Shabbat. Now, I'm a religious Zionist, and part of being a religious Zionist means we're taking the messianic times in our hands and we're doing something about it. All right? I, would be not, I wouldn't be in Israel today. I wouldn't have made my Aliyah 15 years ago if I didn't believe that we're living in messianic times. Exactly. Right? I, w I want to be a chapter heading in Jewish history, not a footnote, footnote <laughs> in the diaspora and, living, and continuing to live in New York. Uh, mm -hmm. So I moved 15 years ago, but it was part of saying I'm part of the messianic prophecy of the Jews from the four corners of the world coming yes. and, and creating our own history there. So, but part of the history is n not to marginalize the non-Jew right. who wishes to be part of this experience. So if I, if, if I read this on Shabbat Rosh Chodesh, on the Sabbath that falls on the new moon, that the world will be n doing Sabbath, well, it's not instant coffee, right? You have to first understand there is a Sabbath, <laughs> right? And you got to be taught what the Sabbath is, and there is a new right? Room. And as much as we love downloads these, day, these days, Sabbath takes time yeah. for people to adjust that there is a Sabbath state of mind. There's a certain way to approach the Sabbath, even while you're, you're in your work week. Uh, and so therefore, I, I, I felt it was necessary to provide a Jewish resource, an authentic sure. Orthodox Jewish resource on how to have a Sabbath state of mind. But the framing of it is an invitation. It begins with the Messianic invitation. Sure. But in order to appreciate the Messianic invitation, you really truly have to understand Sabbath before Sinai. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm not saying, I want to make this very clear, I'm not saying for the salvation of Christians you have to keep Sabbath. But why wouldn't you want to accept but, but, an invitation I, I, but, from the king? <laughs> why wouldn't you? Right. So there's an appointed time. Right. Exactly. The first appointed time in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, we yeah. know there are mo'adim. There are, are appointed times. In Shabbat and Leviticus chapter 23, call Shabbat and mo'ed. But the first mo'ed was in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, which is Shabbat. So in order to understand and appreciate the invitation of Isaiah 66, verse 23, we have to go back to the Sabbath before Sinai. Yes. And what I'm advocating for is for Christians to have a better appreciation of this invitation. And that's the purpose of the book. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I can't help but think, I think it's Isaiah 56, where it talks about <clears throat> the eunuch, the foreigner, the nokri, who takes on the Sabbath, uh, how... Uh, it's totally open to them as well. And uh, we know from the Gospels, Yeshua said that the Sabbath was made for humanity, not humanity for the Sabbath. So that really is the first divine appointment in the, uh, the whole Bible where God wants to meet with you. Why would you not want to meet with God? Right. So I think, it's, I think one, of the things, one of the things I put in the book is saying, well, God put you in his calendar how about on Saturday night you put him into your calendar what a concept. for the up and coming meeting that you're going to have with God? Yes, exactly. So that you already begin Sabbath state of mind on Saturday night. So Sat Shabbat for us is starts beginning on Friday evening and ends on Saturday evening since days begin in the evenings. Right. First of all, you have to first understand that concept, but that comes from the Bible and the first days of creation, yes. right? It was evening, it was morning, the first day, the second day, and so day on and so forth. So I think there's a lot, 
And I just want to make this very clear. This doesn't take away from Christians having their church service on Sunday. Well, the temple, they had to meet every day. So that's what I tell them. Every day they had to do it. So, so. I want to make this very clear. I'm not asking you yeah. to replace Sunday in any shape, way, or form. Uh, I don't think many Christians even view their attendance on Sunday at a church as a Sabbath. No, they're just, they just they do their half hour or their one hour and, and that's the, it. the whole day is not Right. Little League and football mm -hmm. and now everything Now I can go do whatever I want. I want. Right. <laughs> and uh, the Sabbath is something really different than a attending Sunday church. attending church. Correct. Exactly. So that's the reason for the book. People have asked me to write about it because a lot of times I'll invite pastors to my Shabbat table in my home or we'll do Shabbat for their group in Israel. Sure. And there's this moment where I bless my, my children and you can see everyone starting to cry. And it was always, it was this, why are you crying? Like, we don't have this. Yeah. I never had my, my parent. Yes. Bless me. Yeah. And here you are, it's so natural that you're putting your hands on your own children yeah. and you're giving them the blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh yes. in Genesis. Yes. And then you're giving the priestly blessing. And you're doing this for your children mm. because you're, you're saying that they're well, special. They're special you, and there's very nuanced blessings in the priestly blessing itself. Yes. But I always talk about the blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh because here you are, you have uh, Jacob blessing his. You're giving this blessing of, of Ephraim and Manasseh in the sense that Ephraim and Manasseh are the first ones who are growing up in a complete saturation of idol worship, yet retaining their faith in the God of Abraham, and they Isaac, and Jacob. And they get along. <laughs> they get along as brothers. But what's more important is they're keeping the faith. So we know that our children will experience Egyptian like heathen culture. Sure. What makes them maintain and retain their faith in God. And that comes from that blessing. Yeah, so sure we want to make sure that our kids grow up with that. So, so that hearing all of that explanation at the Shabbat table and then just having a meal and we have special foods at the meal and we're talking about the Torah portion of the week or questions that we have on the Bible and just having that natural conversation piques the interest of people who are at the Shabbat table. And they say, you, should need, you need to write a book. Yeah. And for years, I was never into writing a book, because I'm in this really to promote Jewish-Christian relations, not to promote David Nekrotman. But after a while, just with the demand, I just said, okay. In the coronavirus time moment, I had extra time to sit down and work this thing out. Well, that is so great. That is so wonderful. Tell everyone again where they go to get your book. Your they can pre-order. When does it come out? December? Your, you get pre-order, <clears throat> yoursabbathinvitation.com. All right. Okay, and for those who want to know more about what we do as the Ortar Stone Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation, cjcuc.com, cjcuc.com. I see you see correctly. I, I, that's right. <laughs> A lot of C's. It wasn't my name. I didn't give the name. Rabbi Riskin gave mm. the name, so we continued the name. Well, uh, thank you so much. It's just been such a blessing having you here. We've always enjoyed it whenever you've come. Uh, maybe what I'd like to do is, uh, since it's always late after Sabbath, especially in the winter, uh, maybe some Shabbat, as our service ends about 1230 our time, uh, that would make it about 1030 your time or something. But maybe you could come on and give a little short message through Zoom. Okay. And you could do a, a little something for us. So sure. we could do a little talk sometime after when our service ends at uh, about noon. Okay. Here. You may Thank you for the invitation. Oh, you bet. Thank you so much. Mark, Any closing you? thing you have? I think that I think I just first of all, I just want to say that you we, we had this conversation off camera that you and I are living in a privileged time. You're trailblazing the Hebraic roots. It comes off from those who pioneered that in that path with Dwight Pryor, John Garr, Marvin Wilson, so on and so forth, and Brad Young. Um, and I'm coming from the Jewish side of embracing this relationship with Christians and learning the Bible for many, many years with Christians who are visiting the center, have gone all over the world. I, I, I think we need to take this moment like you and I who are on the pioneering path of all this with the past memories of people who have done this, who are still living and continuing to do this and just say, thank God we are privileged to see this moment together. And just to be on your show to me is a miracle because this wouldn't have happened 30 years ago. You know this. Yeah. This was not 
something that was accepted. 30 years ago, anyone who was dealing with Israel in the church was considered, yeah, he's the Israel guy. And it wasn't a nice right. term. Right, right. Right? And now what you're seeing with the help of what you're doing in your ministry is, no, that's our Israel guy. Like there's sort of a proud moment in, in the ministries and the churches that we, we're very happy someone is taking on that calling actively. Well, I'm just so grateful for you and uh, for you being the pioneer that you are and the organization you're working with. And uh, we just love you and we love what you're doing. And we just feel so privileged that we can enter a relationship because for many years I tried to get relationships with Orthodox Jews and it just wasn't happening. I remember you. I remember your first call and I, I said to you right away, yes. And then we met because really through Randy and Sherry Lush, yeah. they introduced and that was it. The rest is history. Yes, thank you. Thank well, you. blessings to you. Or should we do elbows? Elbows. Oh, oh elbows. okay. Oh, we'll sanitize oh. after. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Be blessed. Be sure to get his new book. All right. Bless. Be blessed. Bye-bye.